Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to North Macedonia. Um, just a little bit of background, like Kathy had mentioned, I've done a number of tours over the years for the Eagle Ski Club, and uh, uh, most recently to North Macedonia. I've been there uh, on three other occasions as well, twice with the Eagles as well, and on the previous occasions we were in Macedonia, but also traveled into Kosovo, into the southern part of Kosovo, and had some really nice skiing there as well. But this particular trip is uh, North Macedonia, and uh, I called it a road trip, because we did travel around quite a lot. Um, and just to give you a little bit of context, the not all of the photos that I'll be showing um, now uh, are from this trip, because we had one or two days of bad weather at the start on this particular week, um, this season. So I thought I'd just include a few more just to give you a, a fuller flavour of what is on offer in this wonderful country. Um, so um, let's make a start then. This is the, the group. Um, hopefully some of you are, are here and <laughs> might recognise some of the faces. Um, and they're all looking pretty happy. Uh, and mainly because they're sitting in the snow cap, probably going up a mountain rather than actually skinning up. So one part of, well, for two days of the, the the week we have access to uh, snowcat and snowcat assisted touring not snowcat skiing as such which is sort of up and down all the time but using a snowcat just to get a bit further into the mountains and back out again has worked really well and without great expense um, in north macedonia so for those of you who don't know here here is north macedonia and um Hopefully, yes, I'll just be able to zoom in on the relevant parts of the country. Um, I think most of you are probably aware of roughly where it sits. You can see that in the little inset map in the top right hand corner. Um, and flying into Skopje is the obvious thing to do. And we traveled overland to uh, Popova Sabka. So if you can see my little and there, it's, it's in this area within the highlighted area. This is in the Shah Mountains, uh, the mountains that border uh, Kosovo to the north, uh, Albania to the west. And the first two days were based there. Uh, on the evening of the second days of skiing, we traveled south to the Korab National Park, which is also on the Albanian border, but is far less visited, very, um, a very quiet area and a, you know quite a rather nice place to go to i've been there a couple of times before as well uh, we then traveled south again after a day on mount korab we traveled down past debar and down to okrid uh, on lake okrid in the south of the country a wonderful spot uh, i'd go there summer or winter uh, it's that sort of a place uh, we used okrid as a, as a base to have a day in, in the Yabla Lisa mountain uh, off to the west there, uh, again on the Albanian border, a day down in the Kalichitsa National Park between the uh, Lake Okrid to the west and the Prespa Lake to the east, and Albania immediately to the south again. Again, we were very, very close to Albania. And the final day of skiing, um, after we'd skied on Galitica, we then traveled by road uh, via Resen there, and then to a hotel just in the north of the Baba Massive, and to uh, Pelister, Mount Pelister, which was our final destination before traveling back by road to Skopje. So uh, six days skiing in total. Um, so um, the, just a little bit of background as well. The, the sort of maps you can get for the area are OK, um, a little bit old, nothing very new. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the maps that are available um, for the Popova Sapka area, which are green and red. And Popova Sapka is, in fact, a small ski area. Uh, it's the closest one to Skopje. It's the one that gets most business. It's, the, um, um, it's uh, if you like, the biggest ski area in, in Macedonia, but by our sort of Alpine standards and North European standards, it's quite small. Um, 
just a little bit of background as well. Um, I, these trips to Macedonia I've arranged through a guy called Metodi Chilimanov, who runs his own business out there. And he's been a fantastic contact for me uh, over there. Um, he speaks Macedonian, which I don't, uh, to start with. And he has been able to provide the logistics, uh, the accommodation, and also uh, the, the ski guiding out there as well. Um, because getting around the country, getting to some of the mountain areas, and with a lack of maps in many areas, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good way to go. Um, so the, the first uh, couple of days uh, were in Popova Shabka. Um, the highest mountain there, Titov Vrv, VRV, it's quite an uh, interesting word, but that simply means peak. So that's actually Tito's peak going back to the communist era. Because um, during that time, um, the uh, Sarajevo Olympics, and this is 1984, when that was being set up, they actually built some uplift elsewhere in Yugoslavia as it was. And this is one of the chairlifts that were built in 1984 in Popova Sapka with a vertical rise of almost 800 meters uh, to, to give a um, possible downhill run, which they did need in the end. However, it still remains. It's still going strong, um, you know, sort of uh, was it 40, uh, 38 years later. And one of the nice things about uh, um, working with the locals there is that on this particular day, this is, this is a few years ago, it's not this year's trip, by the way, um, the weather was quite bad, but we wanted to get up the mountain to you know, get some RP skiing. But the chairlift wasn't running because the ski area was sort of closed. But uh, Metodi, he sort of said, oh, hold on a moment. He made a phone call, rang up the chairlift and asked if they could run it. And said, yeah, of course, um, three euros each. OK, sounds like a good deal to us. So we all trolled up to the top, having paid on three euros. Uh, once the last one I was off at the top, Chair have stopped and we went off skiing. It's that sort of a place. Very, very friendly, very hospitable. And a little bit of a little of a cultural side as well. You know, the ski area, again, not this year, but uh, just sort of highlighting perhaps some of the religious and cultural mix of Macedonia. Um, very, there's a lot of Albanians actually live in this part of Macedonia, a lot of Muslims. Um, uh, so you get this sort of fascinating sort of juxtaposition of skiing and uh, people in Islamic dress, as, as well as uh, Christians as well. And everybody gets on pretty well in this country in that respect, which again is nice to see. Um, another little thing from a, a few years ago, uh, the guy going up the, the Palmer, this guy is actually the ski patrol. There was two of them, and they were very, very proud of the fact that they were a ski patrol. Uh, I did query him about the, the two bits of wood you can see attached to his rucksack because they, they're actually just two bits of uh, tongue and groove that you would use you know, for cladding in the house or something. And they said, ah, spins for broken legs. I said, okay, fine, <laughs> why not? And uh, a final little bit of background, um, you know, even say, taking selfies, um, a little bit strange. I mean, how often will you see somebody walking a uphill, towing a, slow, towing a sledge, and actually doing a selfie at the same time? But uh, anyway, it's, it's a, a nice, nice touch. However, this is a uh, sort of terrain around Popovasapka. Now, again, I would emphasize we didn't have this weather in the first two days of our trip. We were in this area, but it was uh, rather murkier. But, but uh, you know, wonderful touring terrain. Um, the number of times I've been there, I've been there, what's four or five times. We've always had really good snow cover, variable snow, you know, sometimes spring snow, sometimes powder snow, quite often powder snow, in fact. And yeah, excellent. Uh, uh, skiing, skiing down conditions as well. A lot of it uh, going down to the tree line. And this year, um, we actually spent the second day sort of skiing in amongst the trees, having got access with the snowcat. Um, and it was provided, provided, you know, quite a good day skiing, despite sort of quite bad conditions higher in the mountain. Um, so again, just uh, two, two or three more shots of um, Parts of the Shah Mountains accessible, you know, from Popova Shabka, either on foot or a combination of uh, snowcat and uh, skinning. And this is actually from one of the uh, Eagles trips um, uh, two or three years ago. 
uh, showing the Shire Mountains to the north, and just beyond the, ship, the, the ridge there, you're into Kosovo, and some excellent uh, ski terrain over there as well. So the, the snow cap thing, it's, uh, um, it's sort of pros and cons, <laughs> but in terms of reaching, you know, untracked snow and, and, and empty mountains, it is a, it's a real boon in this area and, and does work quite well. Um, and the, the trip that we would have done this year, but we've done previously, was um, having snow cat access. Uh, uh, I've just got the, the, the uh, to just behind this peak there where the cursor is, uh, skiing down to that coal and then skiing down into this valley. So it's a good 800 meter descent of really high skiing and then skinning back up to a coal um, just behind uh, the, the individual there. So this is on that particular descent, uh, going down into this valley, which I've never seen anybody else down there at all, only, only the group I've been skiing with. Um, very good snow, typically. Uh, good terrain, you know, not too demanding, but challenging and interesting enough. And then skinning up the, out, of, out of the valley, um, you know, for a 40, 50 minute skin back up to meet the snow cat. And uh, on this particular day, he bought some beer as well. So we had a, a great picket lunch in the sun. Uh, this is this is an Eagles group. So I'm still still within remit, hopefully. <laughs> um, um, and that after a nice lunch, we then went up the peak to the left there, uh, partly by snow cat and then skinning and booting and uh, had a couple more runs there. So um, from there, we moved on to the Korab National Park, which is a fascinating area. It's got one of the highest mountains in the Shah Mountains. Um, uh, quite difficult of access, but it, it makes for quite a good adventure. So we're, we're, we're now on uh, to this, this year's pictures, um, photos, because to, to get close to the mountain, you, you need four wheel drive vehicles. So it's quite hard to do in an independent sort of way. Um, uh, and you need the four-wheel drive vehicles to get up to a, a police post, a border post, where you have to be checked, checked in and checked out. Um, sometimes they look at your passports and uh, check you back again when, when you come back down. And then this road, which goes up to the mountains, and so this year there have been quite, quite bad rock falls, and there was just enough space to get the, uh, the vehicles between the rocks. The first year I came here, we couldn't even get this far, it was deep in snow. So we had about an extra seven kilometers of skinning up the road. And, but eventually you get up to the, the summer um, border post, which is a lot higher up. Um, and, and then start skinning up to the beach forest. And one of the characteristics of uh, uh, skiing in Macedonia are, are the beach forests um, and skinning up and this sort of train, but skiing down, as you see later on, uh, is, is just wonderful. Uh, after a nice space between the trees, you know, good light uh, and excellent snow. Uh, you get above the trees into the sort of meadow areas uh, and up towards uh, Mount Korab itself. Uh, and again, this is some of the group this year. Um, we At this point, we split into two groups. So um, uh, Dimitri and uh, Boris, uh, the local guides with us, they continued up this particular ridge up towards the subsidiary summit that we went to. We don't, it was quite a, a big day, uh, a really big day to get to Mount Korab itself. Um, so we get up to a subsidiary summit, get a fantastic ski down. Um, so with two of the group, I, I went down to the cold, just below us, and then we, we skied off down to the right and had a really good run down there. So, um, this is uh, a couple of years, years ago. This is from the, the higher, higher peak skiing down. Again, no tracks, no people, just, just you and the mountain and a, a national park, which nobody else goes to. Um, the first time we went up there, the police said, uh, this was uh, right at the end of February. They said, ah, you were the first people here this year. So they've had no, no visitors up into this area in the, in the whole of uh, January and February. And probably November and December, of course, as well. Uh, so just uh, a couple of shots of the rather nice skiing. Uh, this is from this year, um, um, skiing down here. I think I just saw Dougie Brown appear. So Dougie, here you are, <laughs> performing nicely. And further on, uh, 
uh, down that particular gully, which had some quite nice snow, a little bit grabby um, with a bit of wind pack, but uh, yeah, lovely, lovely terrain. Um, from Korab, we, we, after that, at the end of that day, we, we drove south to Ockrid, and this is Ockrid, Ockrid old, old town. It, I mean, you could almost be on one of the Greek islands, but you're actually <laughs> quite high in the Balkan mountains, of course. So historically, cult culturally, uh, a fantastic place. And the old town is full of Roman ruins, uh, amphitheaters, walls, the fortress and everything. Very lovely spot uh, by, by the lake. Our hotel was right in the lake. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite a nice spot. So actually this year, uh, two people in the group had a, had a day out from skiing and just enjoyed uh, visiting uh, the old town. Uh, a monastery down the side of the lake and uh, a prehistoric pre uh, lake footage that they'd reconstructed from, uh, you know, from the evidence, uh, you know, from the archaeologists that had found along the lake shore. So a, a lovely spot. And in this particular view in the distance, there is Galicitsa, which is one of the mountains that we skied on. So uh, again, skiing there with uh, lovely lake views. Uh, the first day there, we went to uh, Yablanitsa, which is to the west. And this, this is a, if you like, a continuation of the Shah Mountains, uh, again, right on the, um, the border with Albania. And here again, skinning up through the deciduous forests. Um, to, to get there, it's, it's quite a, well, about a 40 minute drive up a very narrow road. Uh, quite icy in places because it's sort of north facing to reach a small village. And then from there, park the bus, put the skins on, and uh, here we go. Lovely, lovely terrain. And uh, here we are with, with the, you know, again in, in the beech forest, uh, looking down to uh, Lake Ockeru below. And uh, Dimitri and Boris are, are two guys, great guys, very helpful, very professional, very knowledgeable, good sense of humor. Um, the first time I came here, which is a couple of years ago, we went up the mountain just underneath uh, Dimitri's left elbow there. And it's quite a nice ski down the, the uh, sort of semi-shaded face to the right. So that this is what this photo is a couple of years ago. Uh, this, this year we went up on the opposite side, um, so quite a, a stiff skin up a fairly steep slope, sort of a steep red angle. Uh, but the view is actually uh, Albania, uh, and the border is the, the snowy ridge in the, in the middle distance. Uh, up at the Col, um, we didn't we decided not to go onto the peaks on either side. It was very very windy actually, and uh, we thought, well, let's just enjoy the skiing, uh, which we did. So this is um, uh, Dave Smith, uh, some of you might know, and I'm not sure if he's here this evening, and uh, Dimitri, one of the guides skiing down in tandem with the mountains of Albania beyond. Um, and talking of which, we, we then decided to skin up the little basin behind up to this point, which is actually on the uh, Albanian border. So that's Albania beyond and uh, Dimitri, uh, uh, was telling us a few things about the area because Dimitri is actually from uh, Ochrid, so really good uh, local source of information and uh, places to go. And he was just telling about the, the days of the old regime, when if, if you went from this point beyond, you were probably shot. You know, this is back in the, in the days of the communist regime, uh, and you'd be shot whether you went into Albania or if you were leaving Albania. Uh, Fortunately, <laughs> things have changed. Um, but with that sort of thought, we thought, well, we won't get shot this time. So we thought, well, let's do a, a run down into Albania. So we crossed over and skied down, not a long run, but again, uh, sort of a, a rather special and uh, unique little experience just to ski down a lovely slope down to the valley on the right. And then we're actually able to traverse around to a col and then we return back into North Macedonia all in one piece and not needing helmets. Um, so here we are skiing back down again to the bus uh, down in the forest. 
uh, oh yeah, untracked snow, <laughs> beautiful forests, uh, the, the view uh, of Ochrid. Uh, but uh, beyond the lake on the right is Gali Kitsa, where we went the following day. And in the center part of the view in the far distance is uh, Palista, which is the mountain we visited on, on the last day of our um, road trip. So the following day to Galiticha National Park, the, the highest peak there, uh, Magoro. Uh, so again, the benefits of having our local uh, assistants, uh, Dimitri and Boris and, and, the, and the bus. We, we drove up the road as far as we could uh, and then stuck on the skins and headed up uh, into the forest and onto the mountains. And just up in the forest, they, there's actually a hut there which is owned by the um, Ochrid uh, Mountain Club and Mountain Rescue, of which Dimitri, our guide, was with. So we got access to the hut, which they're currently doing up, uh, which provided a, a nice space um, uh, on the way up and on the way down for a bit of a break. Um, anyway, as we went up, um, again, nice skinning uh, up through the beech forests. Very photogenic. It's uh, difficult to make progress with the numbers of photographs being taken by various people. And then up into the sort of like a, a, a quarry or a coon feature higher up. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the uh, terrain is sort of quite, you feel quite familiar with in being sort of British with, um, you know, because these mountains have all been glaciated in the past. So coons and quarries, uh, you know, nice ridges and some quite broad summit areas as well. Uh, but the difference being good cover of snow, of course, and cheaper. Um, so on this particular day, we the whole group was skinning up. Um, some of the group decided to do a bit of extra skiing. So they went ahead and skied down the, the, the sunny open gully, sort of directly under the sun there, back down, and then went around the back to the left, as you look at it, up the, the sort of easy valley hidden behind. But for, for some of us, it gave us some really good skiing on reasonably steep terrain. And up on the, the top of this mountain, quite sort of cairngorm like, fairly open and rounded, but again, as, as you saw with the coombs or quarries to, to give some very interesting skiing. So this view is looking northwards. You can see uh, Ochrid, the, you know, the town of Ochrid is here where we spent the night, and Yablanitsa, the mountains over there on the uh, Albanian border. Uh, so continuing down, uh, we turn from this, in this picture here, we, we decided to, to go down into the, uh, into the, the coom on the right, and had a really nice run down the steeper slopes there. And, and again, looking, looking down, uh, you see the rest of the group sort of further down in the in the coom. Uh, we had quite a good variety of, of uh, snow that particular day. Um, uh, so skiing down into the the beech woods. Uh, once we got into the beech woods, because the with the shade and being north facing here, uh, probably had some of the best powder conditions. I've enjoyed in, in, in any forest, but certainly in beech forest, there was a layer of light, silky powder snow on, on a good base. And although it looks a little bit tight, if you looked ahead and <laughs> kept turning, um, it gave some really good skiing. You can just see uh, Boris there uh, uh, skiing down through the trees, but the, the snow quality was absolutely stunning. It was, it was one of the, the best, best descents uh, of the winter, certainly. Uh, down to the bus, loading up, uh, and we and for our last day, uh, my little alarm was gone. I'm almost running out of time. <laughs> you might have heard that. The, the last day was on Pallister Peak, uh, uh, with the, the benefit of snowcat, and uh, it was quite an interesting thing because we, I, I talked to the, the snowcat owner the night before about prices because in, in the deal I did for the group, we. Uh, we included a, a, on this particular day snow cat access to and from the hut up on the mountains and then a single ride to the top uh, and then the assumption was that people would then go off skinning and uh, 
you know, do, do a, that sort of touring. But we came up with a plan to actually offer, well, if you do a second ride, it would cost so much. And if you maybe, if you thought you were having quite a good time, you, you could actually just keep using the snowcat all day and it would only cost that amount more, not a huge amount more. So we, we, we went up to the top. This is an old photo, it was quite cloudy the first day we went up. Um, so this is uh, from a couple of years ago on the top of the mountain from where you can look south to Mount Olympus and Greece and other places. Um, but from there, you, you can get some very nice skiing. Once you come off the, the top area, which is often sort of quite wind affected, you come to these small trees where the, the, the powder tends to be better. So we continued with the first run down through this wonderful uh, tree, you know, glade style skiing, lots of space, making life really nice, very good snow and uh, down to the bottom. So we got down to the bottom and I said to everybody, well, what's it going to be? Anybody uh, want to go skinning, basically? And there was deadly silence. Anybody want to do just one trick more? Uh, silence. Have you, anybody want to stick with the snow cap for the rest of the day? Everybody did. <laughs> uh, so even the, the diehard tourists, of which there's some in that photograph, I won't name, and I won't give anybody's name away, but even the diehard tourists were very happy. And we had a fantastic day. Because one thing about the snowcat operation here is that uh, no one else goes there and then they have one group a day. So even though they hadn't had fresh snow for uh, quite a few days since early in the week, there was loads and loads of fresh powder to do. And they provide lunch as well in their little hut, which was rather nice. So this is the top of, top of the mountain up for a second ride. And we, we did several runs down sort of on, on the east side of the mountain and then coming around onto the north side back into the, the, the glade skiing area again. Uh, this gives an idea of the sort of the bowl that we were in. So you can see my cursor, the huts down here, the summit is there. So some very good runs down this area um, or off the top down the ridge just behind and then around the corner onto this face and down for the forest and to pick up the snow cats again, or indeed on, on the side where this photograph was taken. So just a, a few more um, shots of skiing on uh, Pedister uh, to finish with. This is from a, a previous year, but it just gives an idea of the snow conditions, which were similar to that in the trees and the sort of space between the trees as well. Uh, and just to have this to, your, to yourself was uh, such a privilege as well. So after this particular day, we then jumped on the bus, headed back to Sarajevo, last night in Sarajevo, food and wine, all the usual stuff, and uh, caught our flights back home the following day. Um, very quickly, um, just a, a similar trip I'm planning for next winter to Bulgaria. I was in Bulgaria. Um, doing this type of trip with my own clients um, just before I came over to Macedonia. Uh, so it's going to be the same style of trip. Um, this is just a few photos from um, the, uh, the Pirin and the Rila Mountains in Bulgaria, just as a little uh, um, temptation to uh, anybody who wants to go some are a little bit different and again just find some wonderfully untouched open mountains with plenty of fresh snow so you'll be very welcome to come on this trip if anybody fancies that next year and of course telemark is always welcome thank you i'll uh, stop it there um uh, I think Kathy's going to give this information, but rather than giving a lot of information now, for anybody who has you know, specifically you know, thinking of going to North Macedonia on their own or, um, or any other trips that I might be involved with, but certainly some more of the logistical and background information to North Macedonia, I'm very happy to pass that on to you, um, you know, either by email or by phone, text or WhatsApp. Uh, that is great, John. Thank you. Lovely photos. Very, very tempting.
Oh, yes, it is. And the food and the wine, I must say, some of the wine, the wine in North Macedonia is, I don't know, some of the best. They have this wonderful stuff called Balak wine, which is like a very, very dark red wine. Um, wonderful. <laughs> it's worth, almost worth it going there just for that. <laughs> anyway, I'll shut up and I'll listen to any questions. Uh, sounds great. I've dropped John's information into the chat so you guys can just copy and paste it, copy and save it. Okay. As you've got that. And there's a question from Robert in the chat. Given the driving and logistics there, would you consider 10 or 14 day trips? Um, you could. It, depend, it would probably depend on how much time you want to spend away from home. Um, yes, there was a lot of driving, but Macedonia is, is a fairly small country. So from Skopje to Popova Shapka is less than two hours. Uh, from Popov and Shapka down to where we stayed for Korab, uh, an hour and a half, another two hours down to Ohrid, um, over to Pelister, uh, an hour and a half. There's the sort of times that you can fit in as we did at the at the end of the day. So we would have a, a full day of skiing and then to say move on to Ohrid. Uh, well, you know, we finished skiing at, I don't know, half three, four o'clock, four thirty, uh, drove south to Ohrid. Uh, got into a hotel, evening meal, relax and that sort of thing. So then um, it's, it's, I mean, it's quite a full on itinerary that the one that we did, and you know, a lot of packing and unpacking, but it's, it's, it's certainly doable. And if, if you are uh, um, restricted to one week, then it's certainly doable. If you've got 10 days, 14 days, you'd obviously be able to do, to take it a bit in a bit more relaxed way. And, you know, there's many other areas of, of skiing, there's one or two areas to go to on the way down to Korab. Uh, you could spend longer in, in any one of those areas as well to, to make you know, a two week trip. And also just pop over into Kosovo because Kosovo, the Kosovo border is only 40 minutes from Skopje. About a two hour drive to Brezovica in Kosovo, uh, which is a small resort there. And you could, you know, with a 10, 14 day itinerary, you could have a, a really good. Uh, um, experience of that part of the Balkans. Sounds excellent. We all need more leave. Okay, sure. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody? Uh, just turn on your microphones and uh, speak up. All right. Well, Don, that's what happens when you do a very complete talk. You're well <laughs> organized, you cover all the bases, and um, so if people think of anything, we'll take questions again at the end. Yeah, or if anybody wants to go into the chat or you know, contact me directly, either way, I'll be quite happy to, to talk to anybody. Okay. Yeah, so here we go. So um, just just a little bit of um, basics, really, if you like, before I go into some of the slides. Um, we went out for a 12-day trip, and it was uh, day touring. Um, the origin of the trip actually came about um, again on a Balkans um, mission where um, I was part of a group that went to Bulgaria, uh, North Macedonia and Kosovo in 2018. And we were with a Bulgarian guide called Lubin Grancharov. Uh, we had such a great time that we were saying, OK, Lubin, you know, you know what, what else do you recommend? Um, and he put the idea of Greece in our heads. Um, so we were going to go and use him to um, go to Greece uh, in 2020, um, but that didn't happen due to COVID. And so, you know, now another couple of years down the line, we finally managed to make it happen. Um, Lubin was going to use some Greek guides to help him. And, um, um, and so because of COVID, he judged it wasn't useful for him to um you know join in with the trip and it was all making it complicated so he handed it over basically to our greek guides um babis marinidis who um then also uses uh, his fellow um ifgm ifmva guides um iraklis uh, moisidis to join him so um yeah that um that's how the trip came about um we were um, mainly using, well, we were always in guest house accommodation that the Greek guys had arranged. And, and it was really useful just reflecting what some of John's points were saying. It was really useful to have um, local 
people who, who knew the mountains, who knew how to arrange logistics. Otherwise, it would be, you know, difficult to 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 do it really. Um, and every night we um, ate in tavernas, uh, which was a wonderful experience because we um, it was so authentic. The food's so great, and every evening we'd go in somewhere and they say, okay, what do you want to eat? You know, well, what what have you got? And then they say, well, this is what we can serve, and and then it was dished up. So. Yeah, it, it was uh, brilliant because of that. Okay, so um, yeah, here, here's uh, most of the team. So we are quite a large group, um, team of 10. Um, here's our, our guides, Babis and Iraklis here on the left. Two of the guys were either taking photos or out of the photo. Um, most people, we flew into Thessaloniki and, and most people from either Gatwick or Manchester um, and organised a couple of um, a, a transporter vehicle plus their own vehicle to move us around. So here, here's a bit of an oversight. Um, we flew into Thessaloniki, which I I haven't um, marked here. But uh, first leg of our trip was to coming over to the west to the Pindus, the North uh, Pindus Mountains. Um, we stayed here for several days, um, based around a ski resort called Vasilitsa. Um, we then came down to the southeast to the island of Evia, where we did a mountain called Deerfi. We did a couple of routes on that. Um, then we moved back up, more up to central mainland Greece. We did a mountain here called Mount Ossa before the kind of finale, really, in the uh, Mount Olympus massif area. Um, and again, you know, matching with what John was saying, such an interesting area to be in. Um, obviously, my map shows, you know, some of the relief here, but here we are bordered by Albania, North Macedonia, Bulgaria, you know, just a wonderful and, and intriguing part of the world. So um, this is our, our first leg. So from Thessaloniki, we um, travelled, um, like I showed, to the uh, northern end of the Pindus Mountains. Um, we were staying in a place called Samarina, which is just outside uh, a small ski resort, very nice little ski resort called Vasilitsa. And uh, we we're very lucky that when we arrived, there'd been some um, precipitation the day before and overnight. So, you know, we woke up to 10 to 20 metres, uh, sorry, not 10 to 20 metres, that would be difficult, 10 to 20 centimetres of uh, fresh snow. And um, so, our first day, uh, we spent half a day um, lapping the piece and, and just getting our sea legs back because for some of us it had been three years out. So it was a really good way to get to do that. And, and then started doing some um, skinning that afternoon. Um, and then over the next couple of days, we're um, making small ascents, um, you know, multiple small ascents often during the days. Um, and checking out some really interesting ridges and, and bowls in the surrounding area. So um, here's the kind of beginning of our day two. Um, I love this photo just because of the the really interesting trees that we, I don't know what species they were, but this fantastic um, pine trees, probably very ancient, you know, um, I'm sure Babis said some of them could be a thousand years old, um, but they reminded me of photos you see of the Californian pines where they're really old and they're really broken down, but still keeping on going. Um, and yeah, as you can see, scenery none too shabby, nice covering of snow. Um, we're looking west roughly here to um, a mountain, I believe it's called Smolikas, which is gives the kind of area its name. Um, that was part of the plan, but then kind of change you know because of logistics um with the the snow would have made it difficult to get there um so here are the guides again um Iraklis and babis on our way up this is on our third day to um a summit called bogdani which the guys are standing on there um and like you say like you can see fantastic views all around um this would be looking further into the pindus um and probably over here Albania um, and this is kind of some of the kind of um, other mountains in Greece. So 
Um, on our third day in particular, we had, um, well, we, we've had some really nice skiing all the days because, you know, like I said, we were lucky with some powder, but some really nice scenery and you know, not without interest in, in some of the ridge systems that we were getting up onto and traversing. Um, and again, reflecting the kind of thing that John was saying, there was just no one around. Uh, you know, the ski resort, it was a, a reasonable amount of people there, but you get away from it and you get into the back country and um, it was just us. Um, and I suppose a bit like John's, there was certainly for this beginning part of the trip, um, a really quite free ride element or vibe, I suppose, to, to it, um, in a sense that it wasn't so much about getting to a certain um, summit, but, you know, getting onto ridges and summits, dropping into bowls and just finding the best snow. So um, this kind of sums up that, you know, we dropped down, you can see our tracks here. We had lunch and and it was the kind of question from Babis. That was great, wasn't it? Anyone fancy doing it again? And we're like, yeah. So, you know, we kind of skinned up again, as you can see. And, you know, we kind of came up on here and a bit higher and, then, you know, basically dropped back down into the same bowl. So it was that kind of vibe for the first few days, you know, just making the most of that lovely powder snow that we had. Um, I like this photo and I just share it for fun because it looks like we're having a real conflab and an argument. I, I don't know what we're doing, but we're probably just discussing where we've been in the kind of day, couple of days before or something, but I rather like that. Um, and so after several days there, as I was saying, enjoying that powder snow, um, we then moved from this area and we came down to um, our next objective, which was this mountain, um, Dirthi, um, at 1,743 metres um, on the island of Evia, so right by the ocean and you know, surrounded by ocean. On the way, we um, stopped off at the uh, Meteora Monastery. So we really, you know, wanted to do some touristy stuff and and it was wonderful to visit. You know, obviously there's a very striking photo here by Nick King. Um, yeah, you know, um, really good to look around there. And then we pressed on further that day. Oh, yeah, there was um, lovely spring flowers. We went for a nice walk around again, away from the tourists and we're enjoying all the spring flowers that are out at that time. Um, then we, in the evening, found our, our um, way into um, some thermal springs, which um, I don't know if this is the most glamorous photo of us all, but you know, we're, it was lovely to get in there at the end of a, a long drive um, and then onto our accommodation. I know we're all a bit, um, being probably very British and a bit uncertain about getting in at first, but we loved it once we were in. Um, then here, here we are, this was our accommodation in Agios Konstantinos for um, that evening. Um, this is the view um, just from the hotel um, that evening then. And, um, you know, not my usual kind of view I, that I associate with ski touring. And again, I, I would say the same, really. This is us crossing onto Evia uh, the next morning. Here's our objective, the Durfee Mountain. And we're crossing over the gulf that separates the islands uh, from the, the mainland here. A um, bit of a, a close to view here of the Durfee, impressive mountain. Um, we parked roughly up here and then we made our way. You can't really see it. There's a kind of hidden bowl, but along the arrow um, up onto the summit. And then we actually descended this west face before traversing round um, and on a subsequent day out of sight but we ascended an east flank of the mountain so whilst we're in the area we um, did this mountain a couple of times. A um, bit of a, a bun fight actually I also laughed because I saw a similar photo from John but a um, bit of a bun fight when we're kind of moving and all our stuff's in the van and then we're spreading it all out on the road and you know getting going but you know luckily this is at the end of the road literally and, and no one's going to drive over our stuff. Um, getting quite high um, towards the summit here and 
this is the I like this photo just to show you the gulf here separating us from the mainland and it's just that sense of light and space and the sea all around us which was a fantastic quality to skiing um, in, in most of Greece where we were apart from the, the inland earlier um, and again here you know we're looking um, north and, and east now at this point so you know ocean around us as we're skinning up this rather nice kind of shallow bowl and again um, looking slightly more east if I'm kind of um, thinking correctly um, you know one wonderful scenery and again that feeling of the ocean all around you which to me was really quite unusual um, I've just flipped back actually I, I did say at one point actually that this reminded me of being in Glencoe, but instead of there being moss and grass down here, you had a lot of olive trees, so um, it made it really quite different. And um, happy group on the summit. And us the next day, um, all kind of surveying what we were going to do. Um, and our, our line of ascent was coming up this snow patch here onto this one, and then actually up to here which was actually where we um we stopped because the snow wasn't so good higher up it was quite becoming quite shallow and hollow and um as it was kind of getting a bit wetter as the day was going on there was a kind of a small risk of of avalanche so we didn't need to go any further because we'd been on the summit for um, the day before so we just skied from this position down um and it might not look much but actually was um some of the most memorable pictures um, of skiing on the trip, actually, um, which is where this this um, various people took these this kind of photo. But this is um, um, James Craven doing his stuff. James, an excellent skier, he's also the youngest of the group by quite a long way. And so sometimes we'd um, be like, right, get the youth in, you know, let's let's make him go and do something impressive and take a photo of him skiing. So. There he is kind of ripping it up. And um, this area that I'm now indicating with the cursor, we, uh, because we had a relatively short day, we, we went and had a dip in the sea down there, which was a lovely way to finish off. Um, but I think you can see from the expressions on uh, James and this is um, Eric's face that um, it was none too warm. So, you know, we all got in, but we enjoyed having a really good um, bonfire on the beach afterwards, which was good fun. Um, so, okay, the kind of third leg from us sort of skiing on Evia, we then went back up uh, to the north, um, near to our final objective of uh, Olympus, which is up here, um, to ski on a mountain called Mount Ossa. Um, and we stayed on a seaside resort called Platamonas Piraeus, um, if I pronounce it correctly, over here somewhere, over there. Um, now, um, the, on Durfee, we had um, a lot of um, very spring-like ski conditions. It was um, sun-transformed snow. So depending on the air aspect and your time, you're either on quite compact snow or quite um, sun-weakened snow. Um, you know, obviously, if you got it in, in the right in between, it, it could be very good skiing. Um, but this day, the wind had got up. Um, and it and the you know a, uh, the, a frontal system was coming in and it was bitterly cold. So I think you can see that um, we're all togged up. And here the um, the skiing, apart from this um, access road that we used initially, was some quite tricky. Um, not only with the wind, but um, essentially a kind of breakable crust. Um, but here again. You know, showing you the kind of quality of skiing in Greece, you have this kind of lovely views of the ocean. Um, and this is Mount Olympus over here, which we were hoping to get onto the next day. Um, bit Scottish, isn't it? You can see the rime ice and everything. And we sheltered in this uh, meteorological building on the way up to the summit of Mount Ossa to have a little bit of uh, lunch and respite from the harsh winds. and. I think you can see on people's faces there's a you know certain quality of yeah it's been it's been hard going. Um, 
but they there you go kind of um got to the summit nice summit um had a funky bell to ring when you got there which um, i think we all enjoyed doing um then quite a kind of tricky ski deck back down in high winds although we had a jammy period of about five minutes when we arrived on the summit to eat a bite of lunch or or just have a, a nice moment before descending but um yeah nice summit and um a photo on the way down by Nick King, which again I think very Scottish. I like that. Um, and then on to our kind of final leg, really, of, of the skiing. So we we kind of moved from our accommodation um, on the coast here uh, to Elasona to put us in place for um, accessing Olympus for the next couple of days. So um, here we are. Um, on our, our day 10, um, I think that's our seventh day of skiing, if, I, if my math is going well, um, we've accessed the Olympus Massif from the west side. Um, and when I say Olympus Massif, I use that deliberately because the Mount Olympus, there isn't a single peak called Olympus. It's a cluster of peaks um, under the Olympus Massif name. On the... Um, this side, as you see, some very kind of rolling aspects, beautiful kind of terrain, uh, but really quite gentle Cairngorm like. Um, but then over on the east side, um, there's some very you know, drops off into corries and bowls. Um, here, we were um, using a, a military camp um, to access the mountain. As far as I'm aware, it's the only way that you can access the western side. Um, and nicely, um, you can, I think if you've got the right connections, which we did with the, um, with Babis and um, Iraklis, we managed to um, use the um, military ski um, tow to kind of get up a, a few hundred metres up here, which was really handy. Um, and then at the end of the day, we could um, come down a ski piece as well. So um, it, was, it was really nice and kind of a bit interesting. And um, this was um, literally the kind of high point of the trip and um, in many ways, I would say the best summit, um, best summit experience. And, you know, we're, so this is um, Scolio, which is the highest skiable peak of uh, Mount Olympus. Um, there is a rocky peak called uh, Nitikas, if I pronounce that correctly, which is um, um, the seat of um Zeus in, in legend terms. So it was lovely to be on this um legendary mountain. Um and I believe it that's my Ticus the seat of, of um Zeus. Um and again you can see these kind of fantastic views that we were ex experiencing. Um it was uh, as you can see on by the snow there there was a lot of wind transformed snow. So um in contrast, perhaps to you know the earlier parts of the trip, yeah, you know, it was quite funky in a way. Your usual ski touring stuff, so it could be a bit of heavy powder, um, some wind transforms to strew me, and you know some um, hard snow as well, and kind of um, you know wind packed slab too. But a great day out. Um, so. Um, I haven't included actually any photos, but the um, 11th and final day of our, our skiing, uh, we actually went back up into the Olympus range, um, but we did a, a skills day really with uh, Babis and um, Ericlis. Um, and although we did cover some transceiver stuff, which was good, um, and you know, crevasse rescue type scenarios, we spent most of our time on some on a 35 degree slope, which was quite um, hard, packs as it were, um, and talking about um, scenarios for getting yourself out of that type of um, ground, um, abseiling and whatnot, if you'd kind of get onto um, steep ground, that, particularly if it's quite icy. So we had a good, good training session. So, well, to kind of sum up the trip, um, it was a great trip. You know, we, we had a great group, um everyone got on really well great guides you know i would thoroughly recommend babis and, um um eric please um 
it was better than expected. And that was always a joke with Babis to me. You know, he kept saying, I bet this is better than you think, isn't it? And and, and it's true that obviously I thought there was going to be snow to, to find, but the amount of places you could go to and the extent and quality of snow was better than, than I thought it would be. Um, and, you know, coming back to my map, um, we've... I wouldn't say we touched the surface because we did go to key areas like Mount Olympus, Mount Ossa, Durfee here into the Pindus, but there's a lot more to do. Um, I know in good conditions you can do a, um, a, a length of the Pindus there, um, particularly although it's off my map, there's some excellent um, spring skiing in Crete where it's meant to have superb kind of spring corn snow. Um, and is a big focus nowadays for people to go there. Um, and yes, there's a lot to do. And and I think we experience a kind of fair um, taster of the conditions, if you like, that inland, in the mainland, you're, you're going to have that kind of snow is going to kind of last longer before it transforms. So, you know, yes, we had a fresh dump of snow, but I think w that would be more typical there. When we're on Durfee, much more sun transformed snow and that's going to be typical of these islands so close to the sea um so the guys were often saying to us that you can have quite scottish conditions and even uh, amazing ice climbing as a, as a result of you know freeze thaw action as well um and then on the higher mountains mount olympus and and also i think what we found with that kind of um, mixture of snow conditions was again you know pretty typical um yeah, so, you know, I'd like to go back, definitely, you know, do more independence, definitely go to Crete. Um, so I'm just flicking back to remind myself, really. Um, near misses, we we didn't have, well, we didn't have any uh, kind of untoward instances, but I would say we kind of had something that could have got there. When we did Durfee on the, so I just wanted to share, this is just interesting, when we did Durfee, um, um, on our day six, we parked here. We started late, it was about half 11. We travel and getting our gear out. Um, and then we ascended up in a kind of bowl that you can't really see. My assumption would be the best line would have been to descend that bowl again on a kind of relatively northerly aspect. But we came down west facing slopes um, and traversed along here. The main issue was that there's some rocky ridges here which um someone did take a right perler on and they were lucky they weren't injured but more to the point it was just very time consuming and we ended up here i think where we had to then skin again to get to this coal to then descend down so it wasn't best in that way and um i'll come to the next photo this was at the end of the day Lovely photo but um this was taken up gone four o'clock and so by the time we got to the car um we only had about 10 15 minutes of light um so you know we didn't have a lot of margin so it was just something um you know all, all's well that ends well but you know um yeah it was a bit late that day even though it's very beautiful um the main risk to us was that we um nearly missed getting some food to each which you know would have been an absolute disaster as far as i was concerned but um uh, like um so many kind of travel trips when travel experiences we ended up not being able to go to the restaurant originally planned we ended up stumbling into a, a kind of very deserted village and a taverna opening up for us and it was so great we went there the, the second night so it's one of those kind of nice experiences really which again um reiterates the what was great about having the local great guides who can kind of sort that stuff out for you um, and uh, although I'm just flicking back to my slide, sorry if I'm spinning around a bit there. The other thing that was a little kind of near miss for us was one of our team had was fully vaccinated, but not um, didn't have a booster for COVID, which was fine in the UK and seemed legit. But when he got there or after a few days, we found out that he his vaccination was considered out of date in Greece. So it's just a, something to watch for anyone on future trips and other tour leaders to um, you know, get your booster if you can. That's why I'd strongly advise that. Um, 
but you know just watch that that vaccine validity can um, go out of date so be careful of that with uh, the country that you're going to check that out because uh, we managed to sort it but again that was probably due to the greek guides rather than anything else um yeah so i will stop yabbering but um basically you know thanks to our guides uh that it was great you know I'd recommend them babis and Heraclis. um I'd also like to thank um, our, our original Bulgarian guide, Lubin, who was happy to, you know, with COVID, you know, give things over to Babis. Um, thanks to my team and, um, you know, Eagle Ski Club uh, for that background support. I can just see that um, in the chat, um, Heraclis has um, given me the name of the, the trees that I didn't know. So the Rabolo, so Pinus. Heldrike. So, yeah, that's good for me as a botany nerd. I ought to know that. So, thanks, Heraclis. So, so, what's the season for the spring snow in Crete? I mean, how late does that go in the year? I think if Babis or, or um, Heraclis could answer that best for me, if you're, if you're there. Heraclis, do you want to say? Yeah, about the Greek, about the Crete, you mean? About yeah. The snow? Yeah. This this season it was a great season for all mountains, of course, in Greece. And also in Creta, we have mm -hmm. the fantastic conditions. Until now, we can make a ski. Until now, I can speak. It's April, May, I think. I think May, for, yeah, to May, three. And uh, you can uh, ski until now in Creta. It's amazing because the season was great. Yes, can I ask about that? I'm aware you've got a huge snowstorm across Greece, uh, but that's not your standard Greek winter, right? You, you can't ski this late every year. Yeah, yeah, of course. This this year was uh, fantastic, uh, but I think the last two or three years is good. We have a good conditions for ski. Uh, in my area, of course, in Pindos Mountains, I live in, in the Pindos Mountains, as uh, Nick uh, say, and uh, we have a lot of lot of snow uh, until the mountains. But in Creta, in the last two or three years, we have very very good conditions for ski. Uh, of course, it's an island, and the uh, clima, clima is, uh, changes every every time. Uh, until now, we can speak in my area. I live in West Greece. I have uh, eight or nine degrees uh, temperature. It's very low for the season because we are very close to the spring, and, uh, and the, the heat starts now. And uh, all the snow, we have also good conditions of snow until now in the mountains, in my area. I believe also in Creta the same. But it's not all the time like this. Okay, I, I know that. <laughs> thanks, Directors. Actually, thanks, Cathy. It's a good question because um, it, it was really striking to us in, in chatting to um, the guys more that like you say, although they did have an exceptionally good amount of snow, um, they, um, you know, it also wasn't un it wasn't exceptional for there to be um, good skiing, um, you know, in all the areas that we looked at, and even the islands. And that was the the striking thing that you know you can plan to go there, say to Crete, um, mm -hmm. and actually do some some really good skiing in in April. So. Yeah, March, April, I think, would be would be good. If, if it's uh, of, of, of any help, Cathy, um, um, I've, I've been skiing in Greece uh, ooh, about 11 times, mainly in the like, Parnassos area, um, over yeah, roughly 11 years. And every year I have been there, there's been more than enough snow. Um, it's 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 been wonderful, and some of some of the best skiing conditions ever I've, I've, I've had in anywhere have, have been in Greece. Um, one one perfect day on Parnassos, we we had fresh powder on the north slopes, untracked. Um, we had lunch, and in the afternoon 
we were skiing perfect spring snow on the south on the south facing slopes overlooking the uh, Gulf of Corinth. Uh, anybody thinking of going to Greece um, for skiing, there's loads and loads to do. Yeah, just, just to back up a little bit what, what Nick was saying there. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, th yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, th um, th well, like I said, you know, we th there was more than we expected and the, and the guys were laughing and they were saying, no, actually, you know, it, yeah. it really is like this a lot of the time. So, you know, we just don't have that expectation, do we? But it really, um, it really is there. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, you notice we went in February, so um you know time. i think maybe kind of thinking of it being earlier than you often your typical touring but yeah 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 go go there <laughs> right there's a question from Anne uh asking what were the huts like in brackets i'm assuming you were in huts part way up i guess that's for you nick oh sorry um actually we didn't use huts actually there was where you saw the photo of the um the greek flag that was a hut um on uh, olympus but basically we're doing touring um that so sorry i, I can't give you much information on that um i, I don't think there really is a, a major hut system obviously there is that one on on uh, olympus and that was in really good condition it was just a a man went to hut um again you know whether um one of the the, you know, John or or Heracles, um wants to say something about hearts if if they're listening. Uh, the most of the huts uh, in the winter times is closed. That that is because uh, it's not a road in the hut. You they can carry all the equipment with uh, donkeys and uh, things. And uh, some huts are open, special for some courses, from uh, some clubs. Club, uh, if they want to make a mountaineering courses, and they have uh, maybe twenty people and more, <coughs> maybe if uh, is open for this club, special for a mountaineering club. But if this um, this winter also in Olympus. When the when the group uh, go and uh, uh, they leave from uh, Greece, uh, I have a lot of guiding in Olympus, but it, it was I I I don't make, I don't do it because all the huts it was closed, the the snow is it was too much, and they not open, so I I I don't do that uh, all the march the the huts it was closed in the Mount Olympus. It was not allowed. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Rackley. Is there a system of of huts, particularly in the in the Pindus, that you can use like winter rooms in in the main Alps? Yeah, can you... yeah, we can use it, but we must make a special deal with the uh, owner of the hut uh, to okay. to have uh, maybe fifteen people or maybe twenty people or something, and this is a good reason to open the hut but we can raise that if if we we wanted to do it yeah yeah right do we have any other questions for anyone um since we now have a panel of experts available uh for skiing in greece all right it looks like we're good for the evening Thank you, Rattus, for sharing some information with us. It's been great to have you here. Uh, and I've put your information um, you. out for the group. Uh, thank you, John and Nick. Um, both really tempting tours, lovely photography, um, and some great information in terms of people and maps and where you went and, and how it worked. So uh, I think that's been very informative. Uh, for everyone, a reminder, these will go up on our YouTube channel eventually. I'm a little swamped, but in a couple of weeks. And our YouTube channel continues to grow as a great resource of these webinars from ski trips all over the world. Uh, and additionally, next winter, we'll try and do a few more of these kind of uh, very current trips and maybe sharing 
two people. So if any of you want to put your hands up, if you did a good trip this winter and we would be prepared to give a 25 minute talk, let me know and I'll see if I can pair you up with, with, with somebody else for that. Other than that, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the diehards who came to all the webinars this winter and enjoy your summer. Go and do wonderful, warm, sunny sports in long summer days. Uh, and we'll see you all back here next winter for the next ski season. Kathy, can I just say, um, if I just like John, if anyone wants to um, tap me up for more information directly, um, then yeah, please do. Uh, equally, Nick, have you any plans to lead a trip next winter? Um, yes, um, probably um, northern um, Bernese Overland. Um, and I was talking about um, maybe a um, trip to the Silveretta um, as well. So yeah, various bits and bobs going on, but um, those two as, as kind of club trips or member to member trips. Excellent, so our trips should come up at the end of summer, sometime around um, September, October. So look out for those, look out for next trip for John in Bulgaria. And yeah, we'll see you all next season.